United States Army Sergeant, uh, 11 Bravo Infantry, 82nd Airborne. He served from August 2002 to September 2009. Uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Served in campaigns, war on terror. He received the Army Commendation Medal. I'm supposed to come up here, right? Yeah. Okay. The Army of Chief. Okay will come up here? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Valorous Unit, Good Conduct, National Defense Service, United Forces Expeditionary, Afghanistan Campaign, Global War, war on Terror, Global War on Terror Service, Iraq Campaign, oh. you got to come back here. Army Service Overseas yes. Service, NATO Medal, Combat Infantry Badge, Ranger Tab, and Parachute Badge. Um, like to his personal bio, it wasn't until Fernando surrendered to the healing power of Jesus Christ, he found a true healing and a new calling from a life of torment. He earned a bachelor's degree from UC Irvine in criminology, attended the Talbot School of Theology by Oil University, and earned a master's of divinity degree with an emphasis on pastoral care and counseling. While studying at Biola University, a royal help to create the Biola Veterans Center, where he served as, as an advocate for veterans on campus. Fernando Arroyo worked at the Orange County Rescue Mission as the Veterans Services Case Manager. Fernando now works as the Veterans Outreach Director at Step Forward Academy. He's the author of a book. The Shadow of Death, From My Battles in Fallujah to the Battle of My Soul. And yes, I had to tell him that we don't sell the books during the presentation. They can, you can reach out to him. He's got a great website. Um, he considers himself privileged to serve veterans struggling with different issues, ranging from PTSD, drug addiction, and homelessness. His job is to provide veterans with pastoral counseling and to walk alongside them as they regain sobriety and control of their lives. Um, the first I knew about Fernando was Bob Casillas invited him to our meeting and I got to the meeting, learn about him, and then I had uh, Bill Cote call me and said this guy is really solid. Um, then I figured I had the meeting, um, so I called him You've been at his office. Yeah. And I spared no expense to pay for his meal at the, um, that fabulous place, the Flame Broiler. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we had, a, we had a good lunch and had a lot of protein. So I'd like to introduce Fernando. It's all yours. Thank you. Is there a microphone? Uh, is this the mic? Oh, no. no. Yeah, where is that? One moment. The other mic's over here. Oh, okay. There we go. There's no slide. Mic check. I guess I'm supposed to stand up here? <laughs> okay, so my name is Fernando Arroyo, and uh, I'm just going to share my story with you guys real quick. I grew up in the city of Bell Gardens by East LA. Uh, my parents came here from Mexico. And I learned at a young age that this is the greatest country in the world. And I remember growing up, uh, I had a very exciting childhood because there was a lot of gangs and a lot of things like that, right? Uh, gunshots and everything. So I thought that was exciting. And I remember when I was about five or six years old and Operation Desert Storm was happening on TV, and I remember watching Operation Desert Storm and I, I remember seeing all the stealth bombers and helicopters and Tamahawk cruise missiles and all this cool technology. But the thing that captured me the most were the guys on the ground fighting. There was just, that, that's what I wanted to do. You know, growing up, playing G.I. Joe, watching cartoons and all that, like playing soldier, to be the guy on the ground fighting was what I wanted to do. That was in 1991. Ten years later, it's September 11, 2001, and I'm a senior at Bell Gardens High School. And I remember that day, I showed up late to school as usual. And I sat in class, and my buddy Max said, did you see that there was an explosion, a bomb exploded in New York? And I said, no, I didn't know about that. 
He's like, yeah, someone detonated a bomb in the World Trade Center. And I didn't think anything of it. Then when the bell rang and I went to my second class, I noticed that the kids in that class were still there and some were crying. And they're all glued to this television in front of the classroom. And it wasn't a bomb that detonated, it was a plane that crashed into the World Trade Center. And then I watched live on TV as a second plane hit. And then I watched live on TV as through the smoke people appeared and started jumping out, committing suicide on live TV because they would rather commit suicide than burn alive. I knew it was my time to serve. I wanted to serve as a kid and so I started looking at the different branches and I remember getting this postcard, kind of this recruiting postcard in the mail and it had these guys on it, it looked really cool, they're wearing camouflage, they're on a zodiac boat going down a river with all this cool gear and I was like, oh man, like these guys look badass, but the equipment, I never seen the gear like that because they didn't have M16s, they had like smaller M16s and they had scopes and laser, like all these cool gadgets on their weapons. So I flipped it over and the pamphlet said, do you have what it takes to be an airborne ranger? And then it talked about ranger school, army ranger school. And I said, I want to, I want to do that because I'm going to fight. I want to do the hardest thing. That's what I thought, right? So I went to the recruiter and he's like, all right, what do you want to do in the army? And I said, I want to be a paratrooper and I want to go to ranger school. And then he started laughing. And then all the recruiters started laughing. They're like, oh, okay, calm down, high speed. Look at this guy, he wants to be Rambo and all this. And then he said, you don't want to do that. That's stupid. Why do you want to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft? I usually wait until it lands and then I can walk off safely. And I said, no, I saw it on Discovery Channel, it looks pretty cool, I want to do it. And he's like, it's not nice. You're going to be jumping out of planes, it's not a luxury flight, the Air Force is not, they don't have, C-130s are not nice. Uh, they said, you're going to be in the rain and the mud, you're going to be getting shot at, you don't want to do that. Then he slid me these papers and he said, look, the Army needs cooks. <laughs> he said, the Army needs cooks, we can pay you a $20,000 bonus to be a cook in the Army. And I grew up poor in a one bedroom house, sleeping on the living room floor with my brother. And I was like, dang, $20,000. He goes, have you ever had $20,000? I said, no, I've never had $20,000. He's like, this is your chance right here. And I said, no, I'd rather jump out of planes and fly. You can keep your $20,000. He says, all right, he says, don't come to me. Like so many people say my recruiter lied to me and my recruiter was full of crap. For the first time in history, a recruiter was telling the truth. And he, I signed a contract, 82nd Airborne, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, my first time on an airplane was from LAX to Fort Benning, Georgia. So I had never been on an airplane before, but I signed to jump out of them. And I remember getting on the airplane at LAX, and before it took off, I was already scared. Because the pilots are checking the wings and the, you know, all the whatever they do, their little tests. Yeah, I, I heard things moving, and I'm just like, what was that? What was that? Like, is this normal? They're like, yeah, dude, like, this is normal, relax. And then when we took off, and then I watched the city of Los Angeles disappear, I was like, I can't jump out of this. I cannot jump out of this. This is stupid, I'm wrong. Like, this is, I, I immediately regretted everything. I arrived to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through infantry school, Alpha 150, and then after uh, infantry school, then I went to airborne school down the street. And after three weeks of airborne school, jumped out of a plane five times, got my wings, and then I got on a bus and went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was with the 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Then about a month or two after arriving, uh, I was volunteered or voluntold to try out for the battalion reconnaissance platoon. So there was like a two week selection process, a lot of running, a lot of swimming, a lot of uh, just pain and suffering. And I made it. And then I was uh, a part of this uh, platoon. And then the invasion of Iraq happened. And it was after the invasion of Iraq that we got the, the call to go to Iraq. And we landed at the Baghdad International Airport. This was August of 2003. And then uh, from Biop at Baghdad International Airport, Biop, we did missions to kill, capture high value targets, 
We were going after the, re the remnant of Saddam's commanders and stuff like that. And then we were told that we were going into the city that was out of control, that the insurgency was running rampant, and the city was uh, the city of Fallujah. So we got to the city of Fallujah, Iraq, and it was there that I experienced combat for the first time. Like, real combat, gunfights, bombs. My first firefight was an ambush. I remember we were uh, inside of uh, Ford Operating Base Volturno, which then later became Camp Fallujah. And I remember being at, it was nighttime, I had my night vision, full combat gear, and I'm looking at the city of Fallujah, and I could see these green and red tracer rounds flying into the sky. And we had this intelligence team intercepting radio and phone calls, and the insurgents were saying that when the Americans come into the city, we're going to kill them. Allah Akbar and all that stuff, and they're shooting their guns in the air, they were challenging us to a fight. Captain Kirkpatrick, who was there in charge of this patrol, he said, tell them we'll be right there. And then Chaplain Knight, former Delta Force operator, felt called by God to become a chaplain. He was our battalion chaplain. He gathered us around before we went out into the gunfire, and he said, all right, men, let's pray. And we bowed our heads, and he said, dear Lord, I pray that you would guide our bullets into the skulls of these savages and send them to the depths of hell. In Jesus' name, amen. Mount up and uh, got on the Humvees, locked and loaded, and we headed right for the city. When we hit a dirt road to the west of Fallujah, the gunfire stopped. We were being watched. The enemy knew we were coming. We got into the city. We drove up and down the streets of Fallujah, and it was a ghost town. But every now and then, I saw glimpses of guys in alleys with cell phones that were spotters. I called it up, and I said, hey, I saw a guy with a cell phone in the alley. They, I was told, we're being watched, it's coming, be ready. We went to the outskirts of Fallujah by the Euphrates River, and then uh, we were driving real slow. It was probably like five to 10 miles an hour. And I remember uh, there was tall grass on both sides. It's a very swampy area. And that's when I heard two explosions. I felt a concussion in my chest. It was two rocket propelled grenades. They flew five feet over my head. And then all these green and red tracer rounds started flying my way. And it was just like an out-of-body experience. I started doing what I was trained to do with night vision on and with my pac 4 infrared laser. I was taking, uh, returning fire to the enemy. Uh, that night was the first time I shot a human being. I remember putting, aiming my pack 4 at a guy and like just watching my tracer rounds go through him. And this all happened in a matter of seconds. It was an ambush, explosions, gunfire. I feel the, hum the jolt of the Humvee moving up. We're driving off. And then it's, I, I fired my 30 round magazine. I said, I'm changing mags. I dropped my mag. I put a fresh one in. And by the time I let the bolt go forward, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. We turned around, went back to where the ambush happened. Uh, the enemy had carried out their wounded and dead. There was blood, but there was no bodies. Reports where we killed a few guys. I was in Fallujah for six or seven months. In Fallujah, we were always in gunfights. We were always getting, uh, like, it was just the Wild West. But to be honest, we enjoyed every minute of it. Like, I don't know if you guys heard this, but combat is fun until somebody gets hurt. Returning fire, getting shot at, not getting hit, it was thrilling, it was exciting, and I did not want to leave Fallujah. I was only 19 years old, and, and I was there, and I relished it. And I remember coming back from Iraq after those seven months, turning in my gear, my weapon, my night vision, all this stuff, and then I'm in the barracks, and I'm in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The air is different, there's green trees, People smell clean, because Middle East people smell like body odor. And everything was just different. It was all nice and clean. But I remember that night in the barracks, and several nights this happened, waking up to the sound of gunfire and explosions, jumping out of my bed, on my hands and knees, looking for my M4, looking for my night vision, looking for my body armor, and it wasn't there. And then I looked out the window of the barracks and I could see a nice barracks building and I could see trees and lights and I realized I'm home. I'm in the United States. No one ever talked about this stuff. We would just party, get drunk, train for war, and then we did war again. We got the call, I went to Afghanistan. Uh, I was in Afghanistan in 2004 
and it was for the first election since the removal of the Taliban. And I remember going to Afghanistan, we landed in Bagram International Airfield, and from there we were split into small teams along the Pakistan border. And then my team, I was in a, a scout sniper platoon, so my team was attached to a special forces team of the Army Green Berets from 3rd Group in Zermatt, Afghanistan, small town. And we slept in a tent, we pooped in half barrels, you had to burn your poop. Uh, there was really nothing nice there. And while we were there, we did missions to kill or capture Hawaii targets, going after Taliban. They were uh, smuggling drugs, uh, opium, uh, a lot of opium there, and that's how they funded their terrorism. So we were, uh, we were out there hunting them down. We, it wasn't as exciting as Iraq. I remember that. I remember we got rocket and mortar attacked. There was one or two IEDs, improvised explosive devices, uh, roadside bombs, and uh, we kicked down a few doors. I remember Afghanistan was different because the, the, in Iraq, it's a third world country, but when you go into a, a house, it's pretty straightforward, kind of like our houses here, you know, the living room, and you got the kitchen, you got the bedrooms. In Afghanistan, everything is ancient. It's like ancient Babylon. There's like, the, the villages are surrounded by these thick mud walls. It's like, like a, a compound. And I remember putting explosives on the compound door, blowing up the door, going in, and then I was the first man into the first building, kicked in the door, went in, cleared the room, there's no furniture, there's just this like Persian rug, there's a fireplace, and I'm like, where's the door? There's no door. And I know from the outside of the building that there's supposed to, there's other rooms, but then I noticed to the left corner there's a hole. So I go up to the hole and there's a tunnel. So I had to crawl through the tunnel that led to the kitchen. And there's a donkey in the kitchen and there's a bag of like a pile of onions in the corner. And I'm like, oh, I'm, not, I'm about to shoot this donkey and he tries to kick me. Uh, Afghanistan was just really weird, you know? So I go to Afghanistan, I come back after three months there. Again, I turn in my gear. And then again, I'm waking up at night to the sound of explosions and gunfire. I'm looking for my M4, my body armor, there's nothing there. I'm noticing more and more that when people slam, someone slams a door, or uh, I remember one time I was told to go to the battalion headquarters to make copies of some paperwork. Like, okay, and I'm just crossing the street to go to the battalion headquarters, and I could hear field artillery training far away, excuse me, and I remember hearing the, the boom of artillery and I dug down in between two cars and I'm looking for my weapon and I'm on the street in the base and I, have to, I, I realize, oh, again, I'm back, I'm back, I'm not in combat. I was supposed to get out of the Army August of 2006 and I was looking forward to it. And instead, the Army sent me a nice letter and it said, Attention to orders, Department of the Army, Sergeant Fernando Arroyo, you are hereby stop loss. You are going to Iraq. So I was supposed to get out August 2006. The Army said, no, we can't afford to lose manpower. You're staying. So August of 2006, when I was supposed to be back home, I was instead at, in Kuwait wearing full body armor, walking around the desert to uh, acclimate to the weather, like just go walk in 120 degrees, just miserable, walking, sweating, pounding water, just thinking I could be home right now. So I was in, in Beijing, Iraq for 15 months. It was the surge, and General Petraeus said, we have the enemy surrounded, and we're going to kill them all. So in Beijing, Iraq, for 15 months, um, we were going out on different types of missions. And it was that deployment where I lost a lot of friends. I lost uh, several friends. And it was very, it's, it's very sad. It was very difficult to, to be with a buddy, to have lunch to you know, break bread and to have laughs. And then the next day, my friend that I was eating with and laughing with is now in a body bag covered by the American flag. 
and we would line up from the aid station, make two lines facing each other to the landing zone where the uh, Black Hawk helicopter would land and then turn off its propellers and then my buddies would carry the body bag on a stretcher covered by the American flag as we rendered our final salute and the chaplain, Chaplain Kramer, was at the Black Hawk waiting for the body to be placed in the, in the Black Hawk and then say a prayer. And then the Black Hawk turns on its engines, the rotors, and then they take off. And that's it. That's the last time I ever saw my friends. And this happened several times. And then it was just a lot of anger inside. It was, we gotta get revenge. We have to avenge his death. We're gonna go out there. We're gonna kill as many of them as we can. It was just this hatred that had built up inside of me. This was my third combat deployment. I was a squad leader now. And we were just going out there. And we were just fighting every day. And guys continued to die. I grew up going to church. My mom used to take us to church. I believed in Jesus Christ at a young age. I prayed as I was growing up in this bad neighborhood. I didn't want to join a gang. A lot of my friends did. Some of my friends were killed when I was a kid. When I joined the army, I prayed in boot camp. I prayed in airborne school. Lord, help me through this. But I started to stray away from God when I went to war. I would only pray when I was about to leave the wire and say, Lord, if I die, take me with you. And that was my prayer. By my third combat deployment, I hated God. I blamed God for uh, my girlfriend that I thought I was gonna marry. She left me. She's like, I can't wait for you a third combat deployment. I can't do that. I was kicked out of the recon team I was in because I refused to re-enlist. Even though I was stop loss, they said, this is a privileged position. I went back to the, to the line infantry. And then I blamed God that I was stop loss. He, if God is in control of all things, I, then, then he's the one that's ruining my life, I thought. He's the one that's killing my friends. So I blamed him for everything. But I remember one day, uh, we, we would stay out for days at the Beijing oil refinery and do combat operations out of there. And after three or four days, we'd go back to Fog Volturno to uh, you know, eat food, hot chow, take showers, all that, refit. Well, that one morning, it was June 25th, 2007, and we were on our way back to the fob when I started what I thought was a roadside bomb. There's a car tire on the side of the road with wires sticking out of it. I really wanted breakfast chow that morning. The whole goal was for us to have our stuff ready to go that we can drive to the base and make it in time for breakfast because I was tired of eating MREs, burning my feces and trash, and you know whatever living like crap right at least going to the base i have a bed a shower and a hot meal and i wanted i remember i wanted an omelet with ham tomato and onions and green peppers and i wanted oatmeal with brown sugar and raisins I, i'm serious i really did and instead i saw this bomb on the side of the road so now we're gonna have to wait over an hour for the navy eod to show up so as we're waiting, I'm like really mad. Now I'm gonna miss breakfast. You know, stupid terrorists. Now they're making me miss my chow. And then I get a call on the radio. My call sign was Bravo 11. And I heard Bravo 11, this is Bravo 12. I said, 12, this is 11, send it. He says, get out of your Humvee and look uh, behind us towards the city of Beji. So I get out of my Humvee, but before I, could, before I get out, my gunner on the 50 caliber Humvee, Tito Taylor, he turns around and he says, oh my God. And I said, what, what is it? And he didn't answer. So I open the door, I get out, I look towards the city and I see a giant mushroom cloud coming up from the city. I got back in the Humvee and I listened to the radio and I heard the voice of my buddy Sullivan who was there where the mushroom cloud just happened. And he says, Beijing CP, Beijing CP, V bid, V bid, V, and it cut off. Beji Command Post, VBID, V-B-I-E-D, Vehicle Born Improvised Explosive Device, to car bomb. The enemy was packing trucks with 1,000 to 2,000 pounds of explosives. The way we drop bombs from airplanes to the ground, they put that much power into trucks. 
and they would drive, and these suicide bombers would just drive right into buildings and explode. And that's what happened. This suicide car bomber packed this garbage truck with 2,000 pounds of explosives, drew it, drove it into the, the Beji Joint Security Station. There was an Iraqi police station that was wiped out. 19 Iraqi policemen were dead. Behind the Iraqi police station were concrete barriers, and there was a two-story building where my buddies from Charlie Company were. The building was still up, but everyone in that building from Charlie Company got thrown by the blast, and they all had concussions, and they were in trouble. 20 or more insurgents were now moving in to their perimeter. They, they made the call, we're being overrun, we're being overrun, we need quick response force. So we were ordered to turn our trucks around and drive straight towards that mushroom cloud. I remember driving towards the mushroom cloud and in the back seat was my, one of my, my soldiers, my paratroopers, uh, Marty Lee Holland. And Marty Lee Holland had gone to a Bible college and he got made fun of because he was openly Christian. And my relationship with God was not good. But I remember that, that morning driving towards the mushroom cloud while my buddies are being overran and we're about to get in a gunfight. And I thought this could be the last gunfight that I have. Like this is it. This is the day I die. That's what I thought. Marty Lee Holland said, Lord Jesus Christ, protect our brothers and Charlie Company and protect us as we enter into this unknown disaster. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My driver, Carlson, and my gunner, Tito, were both atheists, they said. They used to always say that. Oh, there's no God. They would make fun of Marty for believing in Jesus. And then I heard Tito and I heard Carlson both say, yes, Jesus, protect us. And then Marty got mad. He's like, don't make fun of Jesus. Don't make fun of Jesus. And they said, no, Marty, we need Jesus. Keep praying. <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes. And then I said a prayer, and I felt convicted, and I said, Lord, I've been blaming you for all my problems. Forgive me for my sins, but if I die, may I wake in your presence. I remember we, we arrived into the city of Beji, and then uh, we started taking fire, and I could hear the bullets hitting the armor of the Humvee. My gunner ducked down, they were trying to shoot him. He had the 50 cal machine gun. I told him to stay low, watch windows and rooftops. When you get positive identification, you smoke them, kill them all. It looked like a scene of a nuclear blast. There was a, a crater the size of a Volkswagen Beetle in front of what used to be an Iraqi police station. There were bodies and body parts, car parts. A truck from the explosion, a pickup truck flew in the air, got wrapped halfway up a telephone pole, and, and it was just, it was just all disaster. I remember getting out of my Humvee and walking to the police station. It was all rubble. And I'm standing over the rubble, and there's just bodies and body parts. And then I see my buddy Sullivan come out from the, one of the barriers. And he had a bloody nose. He had one pupil bigger than the other. Watery eyes, because the concussion from the blast. Full body armor. His M4 in front of him. I walked towards him. I said, Sully, are you okay? He said, I just killed 20 insurgents, and I'm going to go play with their bodies later. That's what he said. So I knew he was okay. And then uh, he said, look. Uh, there's this blimp with this high-powered camera that we have on our main base. They're watching us. We are surrounded. The enemy is coming from all around us. They're moving in teams of 10 or more. They're trying to overrun us. The first wave, they all died. And now there's more waves coming. Close air support is not available for another 45 minutes. They're either refueling and rearming or they're uh, supporting another unit. Welcome to Iraq, like that's how it is. And QRF, the ground reinforcements, it's gonna take them over an hour to get to us because they booby, they booby trapped the road leading to the main base with like 20 bombs. We are on our own for the next hour. For the next hour, we fought off wave after wave of insurgents. And after that hour was over and close air support showed up, when the Kiowa helicopters did their gun runs and rockets, they shot their rockets, they ran out of ammo to where the pilots and co-pilots, the Kiowa helicopters don't have doors. So then the pilots would just fly by and shoot their M4s. And they were throwing hand grenades from the helicopters. 
until they finally ran out of all ammunition. Then they started dropping smoke grenades to mark where the enemy was so that we could call in indirect fire and kill them. And that, that day, that one hour, that morning, it was reported we killed over 200 insurgents. A few months later, I'm back home. I turn in my gear and I am given orders. Thank you. I was given orders. You have 10 days to get out. 10 days to get out of the army. I turned in my gear. I was excited. Freedom. I'm free. Forget the army. And, uh, and then I was a civilian. And quickly I realized that uh, I was falling apart. It was like the soundtrack on replay in my mind where I would hear gunfire, explosions. It was just playing all the time. I was going to Cerritos College at the time and I'm walking through campus and that's all I hear is gunfire. I'm watching people, people's hands. I want to know what's going on. I remember seeing some Muslim girls walking on campus and my heart started racing and I thought, why is the enemy here? When I would get home after school, my house, it was not safe and I always carried my pistol. So I would open the door, pull my pistol out, and I would clear every room in my house, search the closets under the bed until it was a secure area. And I couldn't sleep at night until I checked with my pistol in hand, my closets, and checked under my bed in case someone was hiding under my bed. The nightmares started happening. The, all the memories I suppressed of my friends who were killed in action, put in body bags, now all those memories, I, there was nowhere else to, to uh, hide them. They were coming out. I remember driving on the freeway and I could hear a song or, or smell something that reminded me of them. And I'd start crying and I'd have to pull over and breathe and wondering what was going on. I was going to church at the time, but I felt like I could not talk to anyone. I'm a veteran. You're not. You don't understand me. And also, if I share with the guys at church what I'm going through, I felt like they were going to say, you know what, you're not, you're not one of us. I can't believe you would shoot people or share the things that I did that I didn't share here, hurting innocent people as well. And I felt the guilt and shame of all that. I reached a point in my life where I was so miserable that I decided I was going to take my life. 22 veterans commit suicide every day, and I was going to become one of them. And I remember getting a lot of alcohol in my studio apartment at night, blinds shut, in the dark. Um, I had drank a lot of alcohol that night. I was miserable. I was tired of the nightmares. I was tired of getting only like an hour or two of, of sleep a night. And I decided I was going to take my life. I grabbed my, my pistol. I sat on my couch, a beer in one hand, a pistol in the other, my 1911. And I checked to make sure there was a bullet in there, and there was. It was a hollow point, 45 ACP. And uh, I chugged the beer, dropped it, and then I pointed the gun at my head. And then I put it in my mouth. And then I said, in my mind, with a gun in my mouth, with tears rolling down my cheeks, I said, God, if you're there, save me. And there was no answer. And I thought in my mind, God doesn't care about me. So I took the safety off. And then I put my thumb on the trigger and I said, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and this is all going to end. And then I closed my eyes and I put my thumb on the trigger and I heard a boom. I dropped the gun and I looked around and there was no blood. I checked my head. There was no blood. In my studio apartment, I had a desk and on the desk was this thick Bible. And that Bible flew off my desk and hit the floor. That was the bang that I heard. And it was at that moment that I got completely scared. I fell on my knees. I started crying. And I asked God for forgiveness. And I said, God, I need help. I need help. My buddy who I went to high school with, Luis España, had been reaching out to me for a long time, telling me to go get help. He called me the next day. And he says, are you ready to get help? And I was still prideful. And I said, no, nah, I'm good. That stuff's for, uh, for wussies. And I did what I was trained to do. He said, I'll buy you breakfast, bro. And I'll pick you up and I'll buy you breakfast. I said, you have me at breakfast. 
So he bought me breakfast. He set me up with uh, an appointment with a clinical social worker in East LA. Bob Weems was his name. And I remember uh, being told to fill out this um, questionnaire. You know, fill this out and then the therapist is going to come get you. And it was like, uh, do you drink alcohol? Yes. How many drinks do you have uh, in, the, in a week? Two. Do you have nightmares? No. Did you go to war? Yes. Did you lose any friends? Yes. You ever shot anyone? No. Uh, have you ever attempted suicide? No. Then I just went, no, 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 no. I lied. And then I turned it into the receptionist. The therapist comes out. He's like, Fernando, come on, my name's Bob. Like, let's go to my office. And he sits me down and he says, you know, according to your answers, you don't need any help. And I said, good, can I leave? He's like, no, because according to your military records, airborne infantry, ranger, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq. I think he's, he said, I think you're BSing me. And then that's when he challenged me and he says, this is your time. You can share. I'm here to help. And I did. And I shared. And I cried and I shared and I signed twice a week. Now I work for a nonprofit called Step Forward Academy. And what we want to do, what my aim is, is to provide mentorship and coaching to veterans and to active duty military personnel who are getting out because I don't want them to be like me, to get out and to feel alone, to think that when you take that uniform off, you lost your identity and that no one knows or cares about you. So I've made it my goal that the same help I receive, I want others to receive, to continue to help veterans, to continue to help them find help, to change their lives. And I look forward to uh, working with the Freedom Committee and to see how I can help the youth, if that's what God's called me to do, and to continue to share my story to help veterans and to help anyone who's in a tough place in their life, to seek help, to surrender to help. There's no shame in it. And uh, thank you for allowing me to share my story. I gotta stay up here. Any questions? <laughs> that, that, uh, that whole story was so much like uh, uh, senior pastor Raul Reese. Oh yeah. Golden Springs, and then he got to the point where he was going to take out his family. Then he saw Chuck Smith on the TV, and that that stopped it. Yeah. It's just very, very. It's just so similar. And it was the Lord stepping in through him as Chuck Reese, and then he became senior pastor of a mega church. Yeah. Yeah, I remember hearing uh, Raul Reese's story, Marine Corvette, Vietnam, and he, yeah, you said he was going to take out his whole family, he was going to kill himself. And then on TV, he saw Pastor Chuck Smith, and he heard the gospel, and then he just said, What am I doing? And then he surrendered his life to Christ. Um, yeah, when, when I think about the hatred I had in my heart, my last deployment for God, that hate that I had. Like, I remember t like telling him, F you, I don't need you. That's what I would say. I stopped myself. I used to pray at least before leaving the wire. Before going out on a mission, I would say a prayer, and it was short. Forgive me for my sins. If I die, may I wake in your presence. And then I reached the point where I would catch myself about to pray, and I'd be like, no, no, I don't need you. Forget you. And I just wouldn't pray. And God brought me to a point where I, I realized during deployment, that if I die in this life, he's all I have. And then even after that, I kind of forgot it. And then I was going to church after the, the army. I felt like I owed God something, but I, my heart wasn't in it. And it wasn't until that moment where I wanted to kill myself and he saved me that it's like, dude, God does not give up on me. Like he is there. He's, uh, I just, I gave up. It's like, I'm tired of doing things my own way. I'm tired of of living life the way I want. I think pride, pride is the, the enemy of God. So, yeah. 
But I don't, uh, could you comment on the current transition program as veterans come back from the experiences similar to yourself, what is the VA and other DOJ, DOD, what, what other organizations, is anybody doing anything that is effective or do you have to get to the point where you're going to pull the gun on yourself and then come out of that and, and then seek help? What, what's helping veterans right now in transition? So, uh... There, there are programs in the military when you're going to get out. It's like a week-long program. They'll help you with your resume. They'll ask you, do you need to talk to a chaplain? Do you need to talk to a psychologist? Most people say no. Excuse me. I think it's pride. But other than that, there's so many organizations that want to help veterans. But I think uh, what I'm seeing is that there is a disconnect between these organizations and being allowed on post to get guys on their way out because the culture still remains in my opinion I know when I said I didn't want to re-enlist they're like you know what you're dead to us like you, they treat you like you're less than it's like almost like you're a traitor like oh you're not gonna stay in then all the higher-ups again I was punished for not re-enlisting oh well being in a recon team is a privileged position bye bye you know um, so what I'm seeing is like the guys who don't want to re-enlist, they're like, oh, okay, cool. You don't want to re-enlist. You're short timing it. All right, fine. Well, we're training. You're going to go pull weeds. You're going to go do whatever else. So well, there, there's so many organizations and so many programs out there to help veterans, but it's a matter of getting the word, the word out. And it's a matter of connecting with whatever base from whatever branch. I think that's, that's what's missing. Like having connections, like right now I work for Step Forward Academy and I've been trying to get into Camp Pendleton for a while. I go to Mariner's Church in Tustin. Mariner's Church in Oceanside has a ministry in Camp Pendleton with a certain battalion and it hasn't worked out for me to be able to go. But I want to make it there because if I could at least talk to that one battalion and start spreading the word that if you're getting ready to transition, like all organization is there, but I have to get in there. I think it's, it's the, a matter of making resources known and available while they're on active duty. So you, total time was eight years, right? So you got, you got the, you had the inactive reserve where they fall and told you to go, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so you had your four years and then, you know, that's the stop gap is the six years, right? So then you went past, I, I, you went past the, those two years too, they, so even more, huh? And you didn't re-enlist, but they just kept you that long. So you're, you were, you did your inactive reserve, and then you, they kept you for another however long after that. Yeah, I signed up for four years, but when I signed up, I was a senior in high school, so I couldn't leave until I graduated. So that counts as one year. Right. Yeah. Then I did four years contract, and then one year and a half stop loss, and then I did. Uh, all, I did like almost a year in the Army Reserve because some career counselors came to me in their uniforms and I thought, oh crap, they're calling me back. And they said, oh, if, if you join the Army Reserves, your last year in the inactive reserve, you'll be non-deployable. I said, let me see it in writing. And then they did, and I signed. And then I went one week in a month, you know, just showing up. And I was like, wow, like from being a paratrooper to this, it was a different uh, way of life, I'll tell you that. Do you find yourself having to uh, call up a fellow who maybe built in the electronic health care? Do you find yourself having to call up agencies, whether it's uh, public or private schools or churches, and letting them know who you are and uh, letting them know that you have something important to uh, speak about? Or has, has there, are there any public or private agencies who have reached out to you and asked you to speak? No. The reason why I ask is, I mean, you have 
great good things to talk about that people, especially young people, need to know. So if anybody, like government agencies, quasi-government agencies, anything like that, reaching out to you, or do you find yourself having to and do all the footwork to reach out to them this week? So I've only, so when my book came out, the, there was a, a, a PR push and the public relations people, they put, you know, I did podcast interviews, TV, radio, all that. And uh, I've spoken at different churches, but I have not reached out to any public or government agencies to, to share my story. And then, uh, they haven't reached out to you either. They have not reached out to me either. Yeah. And then I heard about this organization. And then you guys speak to kids in schools. I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I've met enough people who are here that are around me and they keep telling me about this place. So I thought, why not? I'll join. Let's see if God has something planned. <laughs> yes. When Billy Hall was in uh, Guadalcanal, uh, and later on during World War II and in through uh, Korea and Vietnam, it was just another day at the war. Uh, if you lost an airplane, you lost some buddies, uh, or you're out of control and, and people got shot up, you were back at it the next day. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan changed an awful lot of that. The, was your group, Billy, asked to just internalize everything? You asked if my group was... Billy, you asked Billy during World War II, oh, and Billy. just tell him to suck it up. Okay. Is that what they told you? Well, the flight director didn't brought out a little, little bottle and had those out if, if you needed that. But most of the time, it was just go again the next day. You never talked about it? So Billy, when Billy and I, Billy and I'm with Billy two or three times a week, and I've been with him for hundreds of hours. Billy does not talk about the gory stuff. He won't. He won't talk about it. So Billy doesn't talk about that stuff at all. We well, couldn't talk about the good-looking women on Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't talk about the good-looking women on Wall Street. There was me. You know, you talked about uh, the uh, towers, 9 11. Uh, one of my dearest friends, uh, you know, one of my dearest friends uh, was a retired Army Colonel. Uh, he was a graduate of the Army Command in War College. And he wound up as the head of the State Department's anti uh, terrorist section. And he sent them a letter, I don't know who it was, CAP or some title. And uh, he, years later, he read the letter to me. He said, you have holes in your airport security systems. And he said, what you have to do, one of the things he suggested is he told them, you have to adopt the Israeli systems of security. Uh, the response letter to him basically said, if you like Israel so damn much, why don't you go there? When 9-11 happened, he just retired. He got a call from his second command to take an over for him. He said to him, Dave, are you watching television? He says, no, why? He says, uh, turn on the television, Dave. No one here thinks you're crazy anymore. Are you going to take a break? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. It's okay. 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 All right. Um, your story is amazing. I think you and I know each other. We've been together for a while. You know, the story that you talk about and the training that you talk about, the investment, the time and, and energy that the government spends to train you and the, the equipment on you, and then you're all done. There is no more investment. You're just sent away to fend for yourself. And it's a shame. This country should be ashamed of itself by not taking care of these great men and women who 
have sacrificed a lot to give to this country. And it's people like yourself in this room who've given the service. And there just takes one voice. If any of you have a voice of people you know, it's, it would be great for you to spread that to someone else because it can make a difference. You know, I was in Vietnam. I suffered greatly. Uh, they didn't. They didn't really take care of me. I had to take care of myself. I suffered for years. But, but there's more that they can do. And it seems to me that if we're going to spend all that time and money to train uh, men and women to fight for this country, then they better spend as much or more to bring you back. So that's all I have to say. that got me talking because you don't talk about it you don't talk about the gory stuff I did not want to talk about it when I wrote my book my friend uh, Jones Jonesy he called me he, he's like dude man like he said you got balls man he's from Louisiana that's my impression of him he's like you got balls brother I can't believe you're doing that I'm like doing what he's like you're putting yourself out there um, he's like there's things that like my wife and kids don't ever hear they don't know it um, so the thing that got me talking about it was that too many of my friends were committing suicide. A lot of them were killing themselves. Guys that did their 20 years in the military have all the accolades that, that you could, wow. You know, they've jumped out of airplanes above the clouds and done all kinds of crazy stuff and then to different countries and all the Rambo stuff you hear about. And then when they come home, their life falls apart and then they take their own life. So then I thought, okay, I have been in that situation. I, it was God who saved me. Um, I need to put myself out there, put my story out there to let veterans know that they're not alone and that there is hope. So that's why I do what I do. Thank you. 